Welcome to Low Code for Developers. My name is Yulia and I am a developer advocate for Vonage. Uh, I've spent the past year working around low code solutions mostly with our Node-RED integration. Whenever I'm not doing that, I am drawing avocados, avocado shaped things and things shaped avocados uh, since I happen to be half of the developer avocados weekly. But today, we are going to talk about low code, a little bit no code, um, what is happening with it, and whether it's something interesting for us developers. Once we get through that, I would like to show you a little bit of Node-RED, uh, since this is one of my favorite uh, low code tools. And we're going to attempt to solve one of my personal problems as of lately by building a flow for it, which is an application. So, low code. Uh, first time I attempted to do research around low code was a year ago. Uh, I was talking about node for the first time. And I started by uh, doing Google searches around low code, no code, flow based programming, visual programming. I really tried. <laughs> and uh, I did not come up blank but there was not really a lot of information that I could find. Uh, mostly around how visual programming tools have been around in the past decade and how the majority of them died. So it wasn't an ideal situation. And I repeated the same search, this time only for low code, a couple of weeks ago, and 4.5 billion search results uh, showed up which is amazing. Uh, and the quality of the content is definitely different. It's no longer about the historical uh, point of view. It is about top 10 low-code solutions you could implement today, top 20 no-code solutions uh, you could use right now, or comparing and contrasting in between these solutions. So we have definitely come a really long way uh, people are using it more and more. Uh, it has been a major help to non-technical people, especially in these times where taking your business online could save it. And that's what a lot of them have been doing. Um, but again, probably without the necessary development resource or developers. Um, so even if not ideal, it has been a lifesaver. Uh, but let us step back a little and see why low-code or no-code solutions would appeal um, to the general public in the first place. Human language is visual first. We are visual beings. And we've been like that for a really long time. Fortunately, we also realized this really early on, and we've been uh, making good use of it in many fields. So whenever we want to grab someone's attention um, to make sure they stay alert, they remember a certain piece of information, um, we use visual cues. Also, we might do that just for fun or to summarize things. Because ideas are visual, not, I'm not sure about you, but whenever I do a brainstorming session or um, thinking gets a little bit tough, I tend to go for either a whiteboard, pen and paper, something, just to make a couple of marks on a paper to have something to work with. So that got me thinking, why would we not use that for code? Why not for programming? Well, as mentioned before, there have been a couple of attempts throughout the years, uh, past 60-ish years, uh, and they've been called a lot of things. Uh, Flow-based programming, visual programming, uh, low-code, no-code. And they've really had a lot of names. Uh, <laughs> but as for users, um, it was mostly hobbyists, 
kids learning to write code, well, learning about code, not exactly writing it for the first time, uh, people working with IoT and non-developers in general. But as far as I can tell, it never really appealed to developers. Like, sure, you would try it out for fun, but come on, we're going back to big person problems with code because that's how we solve problems. Uh, yes. So there have been a set of challenges uh, with these solutions, visual programming languages, that in the meantime may or may not have been solved. Um, but the usual feedback is that there have been issues around abstraction, code reuse, defend merge, and code comments. Also, I have never managed to give a talk about Node or low code without someone in the audience asking me, okay, so where is the exported code? Where is the generated code? Where can I see it? Uh, I'm sorry, there is no generated code. And that brings us to this uh, situation where we are so used to writing code and solving problems with code that we just got logged into that mindset. We have a set of rules, we have a set of standards, and we compare every other tool to the same standards. So we have a hammer in our hands and we've been perfecting that hammer for years. And now everything looks like a nail. But now we suddenly have a crowbar as well. I am not trying to tell you that low code or no code is a new thing that will replace code and engineering teams and whatnot. Uh, I would just like to propose the idea that there are different problems and there are different tools that we can use to solve those problems. And maybe we could take the time to go through these and pick the right tool for the right problem. So let's say um, one low code could be a good idea. The first thing I like to mention is prototyping because having a low code solution means that you can focus on the main logic. You can build whatever you have in your mind. Also make it visual and you have a blueprint that you can come back to later when you start developing the product. But at the end of the prototyping, you also have a minimum viable product that you can demo to a client while the competitor is still trying to figure out what libraries they are gonna use. Another good place to start is for low value, low complexity tasks. I am really trying not to say the word grunt word, but this is the kind of tasks that are repetitive, have to be done, someone has to do them, but they aren't necessarily worth your development time or the things that are a nice to have, but not strictly related to your core work. Um, a good example would be um, our team uses Zapier well, a Zap, which is a task in Zapier, um, another low code platform, to pull in uh, tweets from Twitter uh, that mention us and put them in a Slack channel. Is it absolutely essential to the business? No, it's not. Is it useful? Yes, it is, especially convenient. Um, is your development time worth for you to write code for it? Probably not, even though I'm confident that anyone from the team would know enough code to write the code for it. That might be something that a manager would have a problem with. But going to Zapier and taking five minutes to set that up, 
that is amazing. And another thing to consider is maintainability. You are an engineer on a engineering team with 20 engineers. Yeah, you go write your code. Are you a contractor for a startup where you're the only technical person? And the moment you leave that project, there will be no one to maintain the code. Now that might be a different scenario. Uh, I think it shows empathy to build something that outlives you. Well, the time of the project uh, isn't 100% dependent on you because every line of code you write will have to be maintained and it will come back and bite you like that. And I've been told that I think it's a really good message that to be professional is to write code that outlasts you and always have the handover in mind when you're doing that project and coming up with that solution. So if you can hand over the code to people who understand the code, do that. If you are handing it over to people who really can't do anything with it, then consider another solution that is empathetic towards them. And come on, let's be real. Are you really a production developer 24 seven? Or do you sometimes fall into any of these categories? And now let's have a look when you probably shouldn't use low code. First, I'd like to mention that low code is not a way to save money on development resources. First, it's, I'm not going to go into cost, but please don't go firing your engineering team thinking that someone will solve it with a low code platform. Talking about platforms, most of the low code and no code solutions are in form of a platform. Now, when you're building something on a platform, it comes with a certain risk, which is normal. You just have to think whether that risk is worth it for you. Because if that platform was to disappear and I would have to go tomorrow morning and check Twitter instead of the Slack channel, I, well, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But if you build your revenue generating product on a platform that disappears overnight, that might be a different kind of situation. So I think at the end of it, you have to use a bit of common sense look at the problem, look at the tools available and the risk you're willing to take and pick the right tool for the right problem. And talking about tools, let's have a closer look at uh, Node-RED, which really is my favorite low code tool at the moment. Well, I've been getting into Zapier lately, so it might be a tie, but Let's go with Node-RED for today. Uh, it started back in 2013. Uh, it was a personal project of Nick O'Leary at IBM. Uh, briefly became an IBM project. Then it uh, became open source and currently lives under the OpenJS Foundation. So it's available to anyone. It follows the flow-based programming principle which means that um, there is a set of async self-contained processes that are connected externally and the interface in between them is data. In case of Node-RED, it is a JSON file, um, JavaScript object notation uh, that has multiple properties, but always topic and payload. Uh, topic uh, comes from the MQTT history of, well, IoT history of the product since that's um, how Nick came up the idea with the idea. 
and payload is going to be where um, usually the most important piece of information will be passed on in between these uh, uh, self-contained processes, which are called nodes. So now onto the problem I'm having um, as of recently. So you know those seconds in between by everyone and you click on the leave button at the end of a meeting. Well, we've been having more and more meetings recently, even though we're a remote team. And we've been trying to come up with different kinds of solutions for um, making those transitional seconds and the not so awkward, awkward silence um, less awkward and more enjoyable. Uh, solutions were, well, included playing music from phones, from computers, but nobody really took the time to alternate the process because it's again one of those things that are nice to have not necessarily worth development time uh, but i thought that it would be a good time to build something for it and let's go into new dread and let's see how that works so my idea for this is i could go and probably come up with code, writing something with Google APIs, because uh, we're using Google Meet for our team meetings, and then something for the music, which is probably Spotify. To be fair, I've tried working with those two. Um, I would much prefer to go the local way around them. Um, and this time I'm going to use uh, the dialing feature from uh, the Google meeting so that I can uh, make use of the Vonage voice API to dial into the call. Um, a quick look at Nedra. Hopefully, yes, we can see that. This is the Nedra editor. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, there are the nodes in the so-called node palette. So these are the um, processes that uh, were mentioned earlier and the building blocks that we are going to wire together uh, to define how data is being um, communicated in between them. These tabs up here are flows and the flow is, well, you could say an application so if I click on one, then these are different um, applications that are disabled. So uh, that's not going to be a problem. On the right hand side, I have an info box, which helps when I would like to use a certain node. It populates with information. This is sort of kind of documentation like, but not extensive documentation so it would usually contain a link towards um, a more detailed documentation and uh, my best friend is the uh, debug area and we're up to a good start uh, that is where our debug messages are going to appear so let's get to it and start building something uh, I'm going to use uh, this node as, also as a control interface for the playout music. So I will be using the inject buttons. Um, node is an event-driven environment, so uh, you're either going to use a webhook or something like the inject node, which has a button to set up your flow, flow being the application. Uh, by default, it injects the timestamp I don't think I need a certain value for it, so I'll just leave it like that. And then I need to create a call. Now to do that, I come into the next move palette 
and find the create call node and drag it into my workspace. And I can double click on it um, to open up the properties. I need to authenticate with the Vanish API, so voice API. So the way you do that is by um, by a voice applications, which we have to create one of those. Um, you can give it a name. A creative one. And then you're going to need your API key and API secret, which you're you'll find in your dashboard. Oops. So you can copy your API key and respectively secret from your dashboard and paste it in there. You are going to define an answer URL and an event URL. Answer is, for example, um, if I'm receiving inbound calls, then I will be implementing that webhook. In this case, it's going to be my URL. Uh, I'm using a hosted version of Moodred. Uh, that slash answer. And an event URL so that I can uh, follow my call events. And I will click on create a new application, which in this case doesn't work because um, that is not my API secret. But it will populate those fields for you with an application ID and private key. I can then click add, and you are all set to go. Now I am going to delete this flow and uh, switch over to this other tab that I have prepared with my credentials. And we have a create call ready to go. Um, for the endpoint, I am selecting a phone because I'm calling into um, the dial-in number. And then we have a DTMF answer. Now, DTMS is a dual tone multi frequency. Uh, these are the signals, um, well, DTMF signals, which are the digits um, that you press on your numpad. And we are sending in the code in form of these uh, when calling the number. Uh, for the from number, I'm going to find one in my uh, Vonage account which is going to be in the numbers and your numbers list. If you don't have one, you can buy one, well, rent one. And the answer is going to be, well, I am passing this in inline because I'm going to use another node in front of it and connect it together. But I could also write a JSON object or provide an answer URL uh, for it. It would then go there and look for instructions on how to handle this call. So what I want to do is, um, I'm going to save this for now. I want to stream silence into that call so that it keeps connect, keeps it connected. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find a certain node, so you can just um, press Control or Command click, and it uh, brings up a search box. And I am looking for the stream node. And I am connecting it to the create call. Then I am providing a URL well, in this case, silence, but it could be also uh, some kind of music that you're playing to someone who is voiced. So I have a document. And that is silence. 
loop is how many times do you want that certain um, piece played. I will set this to zero, which will play it on an infinite loop. I'll also add an inject node to set it off. And the debug node at the end of it. Now, this create call node once deployed will give me a call unique ide identifier, and I will need to use that further down in um, my flow. So I will use a change node to save that value. Node.red has three kinds of um, context message. It's the message object for everything that is connected, flow context for everything that is on the same tab, and global, which goes for any tab. Uh, in this case, I would like to set it as a flow variable so that I can access it from uh, different parts of this tab. And I want flow.uuid to take the value of, I'll show you why. I'm giving it this one uh, as soon as we try it out. Um, it is going to come through as message.payload.uuid. And I would like to see the whole message object in my debug area. And now, I'll just take that meeting out. And hopefully when I run it, Yes, I am already in that uh, same call from a different computer, as you can see my side view. Uh, and hopefully our application will join as well. And it did. We can see that virtual number join currently streaming silence. Um, that's that that interesting. So let's make it do something. I'll keep using inject nodes because um, it's easy to just set it up uh, with the buttons. Let's play some real music. So for that, I will need a play audio node. Oh yes, I promised I would show you how it came through. So it is the message object that is being um, debugged because of that. And if we look in payload, it will have the call UUID, the identifier. Uh, this is important because I will need to put that in here so that I can play the music in the same call as before. To do that, I will select um, the voice application I created in the create call node, which is test again and again. And to reference um, the UUID from up here on the right, I will uh, use mustache templating, which looks like that. And I am using flow.uuid because I use the to set its value to message.payload.uuid. The action I would like to do is start playing an audio file. And for the audio URL, um, I have one saved for that.
never going to achieve the result because it disappears. And the audio URL will be in there. This time we will we'll keep loop to one. And we probably want also a way to stop the music once we start it. Uh, now we can either do a stop audio or a hang up. Probably a hang up would be good because otherwise there's no way of uh, getting that number out of the meeting, except if I run out of credit, which I would rather not. So we're selecting the voice application again, setting call UUID to flow the UUID again, adding another inject node. Probably we could wire these all into a debug. Seeing the complete message object. I just like to do that. Not always necessary, but I like knowing that I can have all the information in there. And at the same time, let's just do a stop playing audio as well. Um, that will be, again, a play audio note. And we're selecting same voice up, same call. This time the action will be stop playing an audio file and an inject node to start it up. Now, hopefully, we should be safe to do that. And if everything goes well, then you can also hear it. That's the reason why I'm in there twice. All right. Uh, so hopefully people could hear that. I can see. Uh, yes, I should be selecting these. For some reason, I cannot. To spare everyone my taste in music, uh, we could do something quick but quite interesting, which is um, setting up so that if that uh, virtual number of mine receives an SMS, it will take the content of the SMS and, well, that being a URL, which hopefully has music, then place that into um, the conference hall so that anyone on the team can send in their um, music preference. For that, I will set up a HTTP node in here. Uh, yes, Oneage is not part of the default Node-RED instance, but we do have uh, packages. So that would be a yes and a no. I would go with yes. I already have a um, well, URL specified in my uh, Oneage account for um, inbound SMS. And that is um, my URL slash SMS. So that's what I'm going to use. I also have it set uh, to be a get request. Yours might be post. Just double check. It's uh, in your settings. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, HTTP in is always followed by an HTTP response that just sends the 200 OK back by default. And I will also put a debug in here. Now, 
Can we make a bit more space in here? Well, that works as well. No, I can't. Uh, let me see what happens if I send an SMS to that number. So that was a, It helps if you deploy your flows before testing them. And here we have a text. So text is hello there, uh, which is not the URL to music, but we can see uh, it's mes message that payload dot text. That is the variable that we're looking for. So I now have to add another play audio node that grabs that information. And that is going to be message dot payload dot text. Looping once action we want to play it, UUID same as before. And the same next move voice now. We will also connect it to the SMS node and to the debug. And now if I send a link via SMS, then it should be playing that. Hopefully you could hear that. Um, I am happy with that since it is already set up for the meeting and people can do their own music. So if you enjoyed that, um, I am co-hosting the Low Code Hour uh, fortnightly. That would be every two weeks uh, tomorrow. I'm sorry, next week, uh, Wednesday at three o'clock. Uh, British summer time. So uh, find me and my colleagues and Machin on Twitch for that. Um, I also got some resources for you and uh, I would like to thank you for that. Uh, yeah, that would be Biro in case you're uh, looking to see me on Twitter is a Biro and I'll leave this one up. So let us see the questions. Thank you, thank you, Julia. You have a lot of questions. Um, you have a lot of questions, and you're the only thing standing between people and the break. So I'm gonna fire through them uh, really quickly. I'm gonna ask you to give single, single sentence answers to the questions, and then people can find you during the break in one of the tables, and they can ask you so much more. Is Vonage built into Node-RED? Yes and no. It is not part of the main Node-RED instance, but you can install our packages. Perfect. Where can I download Node-RED from? Uh, the third point in my list, node-red.org. Perfect. Can you use Node-RED to receive a phone call as well as making one? Yes, you can. Uh, that would be my first link in there where you can find uh, my Node-RED related tutorials which covers both making and receiving phone calls and uh, much more. Perfect. Are there any other local tools you'd recommend looking at other than Node-RED and Zapier? So I'm going to hold my recommendation, but actually we have a goal of trying new low code uh, tools on our Twitch stream. And next week is going to be if this, then that. So maybe come along. Um, 
Okay, perfect. I will come up I... with an answer. I don't have one yet. <laughs> okay, perfect. IFTTT sounds like a good, like a good runner up. Can I run the flow you've built without installing Node-RED on my server? I'm not sure what you mean by run. Uh, Build and run? I'm, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I, we're gonna there go with, I, is an Electron app um, that Sam, Alex, and myself have been working on, and it is released now. And I'm going to tweet out the link to it uh, where you can download that, because I completely missed it from the resources list. Uh, but upper left hand side, that is my Twitter handle, so you will find it in there in the upcoming 20 minutes. Uh, Okay. We have an electron app. You can build it and use it with Angrok. So you'll have to see how you feel about Angrok. Perfect, perfect. That was a whole lot, a whole lot more than a sentence, but uh, the, the short answer is yes. And then um, the, the last question, are there any online playgrounds you can recommend we can use Node-RED? So online playgrounds for Node-RED. I wouldn't call it the playground, but IBM has an online version. Okay, perfect. I'm going to class that as a yes. Thank you for answering the question. Also, the can... playground would be, well, not online, but you can download the Electron app. Thank you, Julia. Um, everybody can find Julia at one of the tables and can ask so much more questions than what I, what I rapidly